I was born in Southern California, a little beach town called San Clemente, um, just uh, in between LA and San Diego. So many different different kinds of music. I the things that I uh, that still I draw upon now uh, uh, for inspiration would have to be. Um, like artists like Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan, you know, these great singer songwriters and, and, you know, hip hop artists like Tribe Called Quest and Public Enemy, uh, Jurassic Five, um, uh, not so much classical, maybe a little bit of classical in there too. Um, uh, Bartok and Shostakovich were, were big favorites of mine. Um, and kind of, you know, whatever else my, my older sisters put in front of me, they would, you know, make me mixtapes uh, as a kid. And I would listen, you know, in my bedroom, just with eyes wide open. My first uh, musical love was the cello. And I started that when I was five years old. Um, that's still kind of the only instrument I can I can play reasonably well, um, but I like to tinker. So I uh, play you know a little bit of piano and bass, and I've taught myself a very strange way of playing violin and viola as well, uh, mainly as uh, to use as compositional aids these days because I like to to feel. Uh, you know, the, the physicality of playing, um, you know, these, these musical gestures as I compose them. I, I began writing music in earnest, I would say, concert music um, about 10 years ago um, in my, what would that be, my mid-20s. Um, but I started improvising and, you know, messing around on the cello basically as soon as I started the cello. So when I was five or six years old, um, it was the kind of thing where, you know, I would pick up the cello and just improvise, make things up, make funny sounds, um, you know, while my parents were, were gone, then they might come home and then I, you know, get out all the the sheet music that I should have been practicing, just like scatter it all over the floor as if that's a sign of practicing. Uh, and then, you know, play the last measure of, you know, whatever Suzuki piece. Um, it never worked. They always knew um, that I had been screwing around. Uh, but, you know, eventually it became uh, kind of a, a part of who I who I am in, in college, I would say, is when I embraced those um, urges to, to uh, improvise and to create my own music and to figure out what my own uh, voice was as a music creator rather than just uh, an interpreter. And I started arranging uh, a lot. Actually, the arranging started in, in high school with you know, kind of nerdy stuff like the, the cantina theme song from Star Wars for string quartet and um, Eleanor Rigby and, you know, all the kinds of musical discoveries you make in high school. Um, and then in college that became a little bit more serious and I started arranging music for local punk, uh, punk bands. Um, um, you know, I, I don't know why, but in the, in the early aughts and the late nineties, like every underground punk band in LA wanted that one track on the album that was the acoustic, you know, show their softer side. And um, that kind of became my specialty was that one track in the middle of the, the punk album that was just, you know, beautiful strings, acoustic guitar. And, um, and then from that point, uh, I, um, yeah, started dipping my toes into more experimental music and I started to teach myself production. And it was, um, 
when I was in the Harlem Quartet in around 2010, 11, and we were on tour with Chick Corea, and he was, um, we were doing a stretch of shows at the Blue Notes for his birthday celebration, uh, which he used to do every year. And he encouraged all of us to take longer and longer solos uh, every show. And um, just being able to sit a couple feet away from, from Chick and observe um, his masterful way of kind of merging performance and composition and improvisation, um, that planted a seed in my mind that I, I should be taking this more seriously. So um, soon after that, I left the Harlem Quartet and um, I wanted to give uh, a real shot to, to composing music and uh, my friends in the Parker Quartet um, they said, hey, Paul, I hear, I hear you're, you're writing music now. Do you want to write something for us? It was a total, uh, you know, it was a leap of faith for them, you know, to, to um, ask someone who has no real proof of compositional, you know, um, oeuvre to, to write something for them to perform at this big music festival. Um, and I wrote them this piece and... Um, while I was working on this thing, trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to say, the type of music that I, that comes out of me and all of these things, uh, my father passed away. Um, and, you know, it was a question of, do I keep going? Do I, am I able to keep writing? Uh, do I need to stop and, and, you know, grieve in a different way? Because I feel like it, it's a skill to be able to channel what you're feeling into what you're writing. And that did not come very naturally to me at the time um, because I was just, you know, figuring out the logistics of, of writing music. And um, so I took a, a little break, came back to it um, and started, uh, you know, writing this piece about my dad and just to see if I even could, maybe it, it would be, you know, cathartic in some way. Um, so I, I finished the piece and gave it to the Parkers and flew out to the premiere and um, hearing the premiere of this piece um, completely changed, changed my life forever. Uh, and hearing, it was my first time, you know, sitting in the audience, listening back to something that I've, created and not being a part of the process of performing. And it was such a different, uh, it was such a different experience. And um, to see these other great artists put all of their, you know, interpretive, technical, emotional skill to work, to bring my vision to life and to express my feelings about my father, you know, and to, to expand that feeling, you know, to encompass everyone in the room and um, to translate that into an experience that people can enjoy together or to, you know, make everyone think uh, together in, in different ways. That, that totally blew my mind and I was so moved and it, it provided us a kind of catharsis I could never have even dreamed of. Um, and then, you know, the, the, other audience members, their reactions, and they, they all wanted to, you know, come up to me and tell me about a family member they had lost and how this made them, uh, you know, think of them. And they said, you know, I think your father would be so proud of this, this piece. And um, uh, it, thank you for the, the space to be able to think about my, my loved one as well. And that was such a powerful moment to me, and I thought, like, "Oh my God, I'm a I'm a composer. I have to I have to compose now for the rest of my life. It's just not an option." Um, and that was, I believe, that was in 2012. And since then, I've just been riding up a storm, basically. I was encouraged to pick up an instrument by my mother who was an amateur violist. And I was 
um, incredibly inspired by my two older sisters who um, played a lot of music uh, growing up. Yeah, so I was encouraged to pick up uh, an instrument. My mom played viola, my sister played violin. So we thought, you know, why not a string trio? Um, so I started on the cello. No, I don't. I think I, I have memories that have been implanted by my family. Uh, my mom used to have sight reading parties at our house uh, and they would read string quartets. And they said um, when they played Mozart, I would sleep, fall asleep. And when they played Hindemith, I would just wake up and cry and cry and cry. Um, now, if anything, it's the opposite. This is not, you know, I'm not just saying this, but I had a, a CD of Kronos playing Black Angels. And when I put that in the CD player the first time, I don't know, I, I think I was 13 or 12. Um, it totally blew my mind. <laughs> that first, just the opening cacophony, just the scariest, the scariest thing I think I've, I had ever heard at that point. Um, and it was the kind of sound that I, you know, I still remember and I still come back to and I still crave. And I remember like a string quartet can make these sounds. And I, I just, I destroyed that CD. I, I destroyed it. I listened to it so much. Um, and I've, I've definitely carried that with me uh, my whole life. So I, I'm not sure if Kronos was the first quartet it's probably either Kronos or Emerson or something like that. Yeah, playing with the Kronos was, um, it was like a dream come true, except it was a dream I didn't even know I was allowed to have. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I was so grateful to get a call from, from Sunny Yang when um, you know, she was preparing to have a baby, and so I, I filled in when she was on maternity leave and um, just had the, the best time. And oh, it's, I could talk about this for hours and hours, but you know, learning the music and just getting to know David and Hank and John, um, and getting to experience, you know, their kindness and their process uh, in, in learning new music and old music and, um, you know, experiencing their, their the patience and the integrity. And it was kind of all the things I, I hoped it would be, but never, you know, believed. You always hear stories about, you know, these legendary people and they're just not all that they're cracked up to be. And, but Kronos was just the opposite. I was like, how? Huh? how can you stay this humble and um, this kind, you know, after doing this for so long? And they really brought me um, under their wing uh, in the whole process. It made me feel like I, I belonged there, even though I was just totally starstruck for those few months uh, the whole time. Um, yeah, so it was, it was incredible. And to get a little bit of a, you know, a sneak peek into how, how the quartet operates and you know individual personalities before that I, before I wrote this piece for them that felt like you know sort of cheating as well I, it's like every composer's dream is to just understand you know the nuance of of not just ensemble playing but ensemble living and uh, you know social interactions and just and how everyone, everyone's own relationship with their craft and their instrument. And so I felt very, very lucky to, to experience that and um, tried to uh, imbue my 50 for the Future piece with that energy. And I tried to write um, the parts uh, specifically for um, 
their personalities uh, to an extent. They all have incredible ears and they have brought so many amazing projects to life. And to be considered one of those projects, you know, is such an honor. Uh, I can I can only I, I can only guess that I, that my music provides a, a different flavor that um, that fits well into this this project and um, perhaps it's you know this the fact that I started composing so recently spent most of my life as a, a performer as a cellist. Um, I think that has influenced the type of music that I write. And maybe there's a bit of a, I keep a, a connection to, to my past uh, through the music that I write. Um, so there is, there's, you know, you'll hear some Joni Mitchell and Public Enemy and Bartok in, you know, just, I mean, you might not hear it, but I feel, I feel it when I, when I write. Um, and I think that that gives my music a different profile, a different a different flavor, and um, I I'm just totally in awe of these other pieces in the Fifty for the Future uh, database, and I just just an honor to have have a, a piece of mine in there too. I have such a you know personal bond with the quartet in so many different ways. Um, when I was ah, ten or eleven, I was at a music camp at a summer festival, um, playing in a quartet, getting coached by the amazing Don Weilerstein, um, who, if you if you haven't heard of him, he's basically the Yoda of of, of playing, of both violin playing and chamber music. And it was during that coaching, I realized this is, there's nothing else on the planet like this, the feeling of four people creating art together and trying to build something together and to communicate with each other without speaking. Um, and that, you know, for any 10 year old, I think that's a pretty, uh, incredible experience to have. My connection to quartet repertoire, uh, it's hard to describe. It's part of, part of who I am and part of how I think about music. Um, string quartet is sort of at the, at the root of it all. Um, even in recent commissions, I've written a, a solo violin uh, piece and, and things for other instruments. And I, I always, I'm always in a string quartet mindset for some reason. I just can't escape it. The way it's balanced, the way, uh, you know, it's structured, the way the voices work together. It's just uh, such an amazing and perfect uh, unit. And it's a vehicle for such incredible ideas. And uh, so when I'm writing, I'm, I'm thinking of, of textures and, and melody and harmony and, you know, structure and shape and um, also a little bit of, you know, what can string instruments do that, um, you know, hasn't been heard a lot before. And, but also just as much, you know, what have violins been, you know, doing for the last 300 years that makes it work so well. So I try to marry the past and, and the present a little bit and my past and my present a little bit in, in the composing process. And yeah, the string quartet represents uh, a lot of that for me. The way I compose for string quartets these days is uh, through more of a production and recording process than a, a pen and paper process. So I do, I have the luxury 
uh, of being able to hear things back immediately. Uh, I record them um, when I have an idea or a flash or you know, a gesture pops into my mind or something. I, I do my best to try to record that um, as quickly as possible. Um, and then and build off of that. So, um, you know, a lot of times composers need to, to work with MIDI tracks uh, or different, you know, representations of the music that they're writing uh, during that process. Um, and it can be really difficult. And, you know, I've done that a fair uh, amount as well. And when you hear back, when you hear your idea back and it just doesn't sound great it's it's tough can be really tough to keep that inspiration flowing um to keep working on it and i found what really keeps my inspiration flowing is is hearing things back uh played by real instruments you know if i hear something uh in playback that that moves me it 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 moves me and i i run with it and if it doesn't then i'll, I'll move on to something else i don't have to kind of wait and hope and um, gamble very much, uh, at least with string quartets, um, since I'm, I'm sort of playing all those instruments myself as I'm writing the piece. Um, but in, in Only Ever Us, um, I think that the good idea, in my opinion, the good idea in that piece is uh, manifested at the very end. It's... Um, it's a, a melody that has been kind of floating around in my brain for years and years in different fragments and um, the kind of thing you don't, you don't know it's there until, you know, it, it just kind of assembles itself. Um, it's very, it's very simple. Um, it's very beautiful. It's personal. Um, and so fragments of that melody you can, you can hear throughout the piece. Um, and then at the very end, it's just, it's all, it's all right there. And um, when, I, when I hear it back now, I, I kind of can't believe that um, it even exists because it was in such a fragmented, uh, ethereal form for so long, just kind of, you know, I would hum little pieces of it to myself without even thinking uh, for, for as long as I can remember, basically. Uh, and um, yeah, when I hear it back all in, in one place, in one section of one piece, um, um, I think like, oh yeah, that's, that's good. That's, that's me. <laughs> that came from like a very, you know, an honest, an honest place. It's nothing groundbreaking by any means. It's nothing avant-garde. It's just, it's just a melody. Um, and yeah, it makes me, it makes me happy that it's in this piece in particular, um, because I think um, this project and working with this quartet um, has been, you know, it's a confluence of a lot of different things in my life um, as a cellist and a you know, music lover and a composer. Um, it represents, this piece kind of represents uh, a moment in, in my life where things line up and um, um, yeah, and I think that moment in the piece is sort of the, the nugget of all of those things just kind of coming together for a second. Well, the idea behind this piece um, uh, is that it's meant to be played um, with friends. I mean, you have your string quartet, but then friends of the quartet. So the piece is modular and it works um, as a quartet and it has three auxiliary parts. Um, 
which you can add or subtract at will. So the piece will work in many different um, uh, forms uh, of quintet, sextet, or septet as well. Um, the idea, original idea being that uh, the quartet asked me for a piece that they could um, give to students ahead of their visit to a school and then you know, who, whoever's working with that student group could kind of hop in and play the fifth part or the fifth and sixth part or the fifth, sixth and seventh part. Um, so I, I was skeptical at first that I'd be able to accomplish this uh, just from a compositional standpoint, um, but I loved the idea of it. And um, as I started writing, it, it, it became a, a, an even deeper thing, this idea of being able to add, add, um, add people to the experience and to the performance and to be added and to have a meaningful role um, to play. Um, that was a, a, a big, um, a priority for me. So, uh, and the title Only Ever Us um, is, well, I could talk about this for hours too, but I'll, I'll just say that you know, in a, in a continually fracturing world of, of us versus them, it just it struck me when writing this piece, we, we only ever see the perspective of us, you know, we, as hard as we try, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's only ever us. Um, and the more encompassing we can make the us, the more, you know, worthwhile life becomes and the more powerful um the more powerful art becomes and uh this piece is just a a, a little attempt attempt at that for you know for us to be a more malleable encompassing uh, uh entity um so i hope that students uh whoever plays this i hope that everyone plays this i hope that you know old people and and babies play it as well um i hope that they can come away with a, a sense of a, a malleable us and that you know even though the musical experience uh might change depending on the configuration of the ensemble um that the, the core of the music will stay the same and um, that there will be, you know, only, only fun things to discover um, in, in these different configurations. One thing is uh, programming. Um, I love thinking about you know what makes a great intriguing uh, program, and I have a, a a quartet collective called Owls, um, which is not quite a traditional string quartet. There are two cellos instead of two violins, and um, we discuss programming quite a bit, and we we love discovering uh, music together and. And the one role we have as, as an ensemble is that we only will perform music that all four of us are 100% committed to and in love with. Um, and so we've, you know, we like to, since it's a two, two cellos instead of two violins means there's not a lot of pre-existing repertoire that we can choose from. So everything has to be uh, adapted for us. Um, by us, so we we don't limit ourselves to to the traditional canon at all. We've um, we're constantly trying, uh, you know, bringing in whatever music that we love to see if it'll work somehow. Including, you know, so we have some Chick Corea and some, uh, you know, ancient ancient Renaissance music and. Um, uh, Scandinavian folk music and you know whatever we love um, we figure out how it could work in a program and that's is 
um, a discussion that I think is is well worth having for for everyone playing concerts. Um, the other creative uh, thing would be uh, producing, which I've started doing. Um, has produced an album by the Bergamot Quartet. Um, also another just a deeply fascinating and fun uh, um, aspect of, of music making, you know, to be the person in the room uh, during a recording, um, you know, keeping people on track and fixing errors. And, you know, for me, quietly encouraging uh, the artists to, to do their best work in front of microphones. Um, and that's extremely gratifying as well. And other than that, I do you know, some, still do some arranging for, for bands, mostly my friends, uh, records, and quite a bit of improvising and non-musical things might include uh, tying flies for fly fishing. I find that's an incredibly uh, uh, niche <laughs> uh, pastime, but there's something about the, so, you know, everything is so m minute and uh, nuanced and detail, you know, in terms of which threads you're using, using fur from a, a hare's ear or, you know, some hackle from the, the back of a, the back feathers of a hen and, you know, tying it all together on this tiny little vice. I, I love it so much. Um, that and yeah, photography and uh, yeah, I think that's it for now. I tend to get obsessed with a lot of different, different things. And I've learned that though those obsessions need to be, you know, fed and kept alive, you know, um, they're one of the great, great joys of life. My message to, to young people uh, playing only ever us in the future, or playing anything in the future, um, would be to, to remember that, that music is collaborative. That's, that's why we do what we do. And it's, it can be easy to forget that when you're stuck in a practicing room for eight hours a day um, by yourself drilling these things because it's hard and training yourself and, um, you know, working on getting better at what you do. Um, but I hope that, you know, everyone remembers that the, the joy of music comes from community um, and community isn't always an easy thing to uh, to create or to find, um, but it's out there. And um, I think it's important to always strive to find community, to make community better, more encompassing, um, because it's, it's, not, it's not easy and it's not worth it to do it alone, you know, as much as we think um, music is a sort of conquest for the self. Um, it's, it's, it's much, much greater than that. And what you can accomplish through collaboration is uh, so much greater than the sum of its parts. Um, and I hope this piece can, can be a sort of vehicle for that, uh, that mentality and um, that everybody can share in the joy of making music with friends. <laughs>